personal finance practice problem using OneNote, balance sheet accounts, and accounting equation. Prepare to get financially fit by practicing personal finance. Here we are in OneNote. If you have access to OneNote, would like to follow along, you're not required to, but if would like to, we're in the icon on the left-hand side, the Practice Problems tab, down in the 2110 Balance Sheet Accounts and Accounting Equation tab. Also note, when using OneNote, take a look at the Immersive Reader tool. Our presentations will also be in the text area with the same name, same number, but with transcripts transcripts that can be translated into multiple different languages and either listened to or read in them closing the icon we got our information up top calculations on down below we're going to start to put together and think about our financial statements starting off with the balance sheet the major two being a balance sheet and income statement we're going to be thinking more on a cash basis system as we go through this we'll start with the balance sheet account types and then we'll get into more detail about the actual accounts that would fall into those account types. A couple caveats as we get into the creation of the financial statements. Remember, there are two primary methods that you want to keep in your mind. That's going to be a cash method and an accrual method when you put together your financial statements and when you do your accounting bookkeeping books. Now, note that in actuality, you're usually going to be somewhere kind of in the middle between these two methods. In other words, oftentimes, when you're on the personal side of things, you'll be using more of a cash method, but certain things you cannot deviate or you cannot get away from accrual concepts. We will try to point those out when they come into play. So we're going to try to go more on a cash basis here, which is often the case for uh, personal finance, but Remember, there's going to be some deviations as we go through that. Also note that there's two ways you can basically put your financial statements together. One way is you can create them from scratch by using the actual financial transactions that you're entering, possibly with the use of accounting software like QuickBooks or Xero or something like that. And it'll force the double entry accounting system to be working and it'll actually generate the financial statements for you as you enter the data into the system. That's obviously a little bit more complex than the second method, which would basically be you just construct or try to build your financial statement basically periodically. So if you have a fairly basic set of set of numbers you're dealing with, possibly the second method might be useful. And notice when you do that, you're really taking the end the end source documents to create the balance sheet, meaning I'm gonna you can create your balance sheet cash account by actually looking at the checking account, looking at your investment accounts seeing where the ending balance is as opposed to entering the transactions throughout the period which will derive the ending balance which is what you would do in a full service kind of accounting system also note there are financial planning type of softwares that basically do that you could find softwares that will basically take the end result pull in the ending balances from places like your financial institutions and help you put together at least a balance sheet if not an income statement based on the end result numbers as opposed to something like QuickBooks which would put, which would put the, the calculations together using the transactions. Okay, so keeping that in mind, if you wanna go the accounting method, we have a lot of accounting videos so you can, you can get better at entering the transactions. The accounting equation will look like this and this is basically the balance sheet. If you're on the business side or personal side, you're gonna be using the same double entry kind of concept when you put these things together. If you're going transaction by transaction, this is what most accounting students would first learn. They'd learned how to do transactions with an accounting equation and then transfer to debits and credits, which can be more efficient. So we might have different terms, however, when we go to the accounting for the personal finance because our objective is different. Our objective is not simply revenue generation as it is for a business, but for living well. That means we might have different categories and whatnot. So we're going to say the accounted equation is assets equal liabilities plus net worth. Net worth on a business side, you might be hearing it called equity. It's the most confusing of the three concepts because it really means the claim to the ownership. So it might be it might be owner's equity if it was a sole proprietorship, partnership equity if it was a bus if it was a partnership, or stockholders equity if a corporation not for profit would be something like net assets. Here we have something similar to net assets, net worth. And then we have the, you can also recalculate that accounting equation as assets minus liabilities equals net worth. This often making more sense in the format we will typically be working with when you're thinking about using the financial statements because it obviously shows 
what you have minus what you owe to third parties, giving you the net worth. The reason this one works good for the accounting equation, assets equal liabilities plus net worth, is because they show kind of the double entry accounting system, in essence, two sides of one coin, assets being what we have, and then the other side being who has claims to those assets, either liabilities, third party, the bank or something, or us, the, the difference is ours, <laughs> that's our net worth, right? So th that's why the accountants kind of like this first one. Okay, so here's our information up top. We're gonna use this information to build basically our balance sheet down below. So we, let's first categorize these. We got the liquid assets. Liquid assets is gonna be a type of asset type of account. So our balance sheet is gonna be the accounting equation. So we're looking assets, liability. The difference between the two will be the net assets. Current liabilities is, is gonna be, of course, on the current on the liability side. And then we have the long-term liabilities will be on the liability side. Investment assets, which are gonna be on the asset side and household assets, which we're gonna put on the asset side as well. We're gonna to try to color code these as we go and use green for the assets and orange for the liabilities. Notice also the formatting that we're gonna to put together when we construct the financial statement, which is somewhat standardized and if you use this formatting, it'll be easier for you to read it and it might be easier for you to present it, especially if you have to present it to someone like a bank or something like that. We do do this in Excel if you wanna practice how to do this actual formatting. But normally we're gonna say assets, and in this case, I'm gonna put a colon to have the subcategories of assets underneath it. And then the subcategory, I'm gonna indent. I'm also gonna indicate that it's a subcategory by being in the inner column. When I complete the subcategory, then it's gonna go into the outer column. We first have the liquid assets. That would be similar to current assets if you're talking about a business. If you wanna use current assets, because you're used to normal kind of accounting bookkeeping for a business, you can, and it's, it's gonna be the more current or liquid type of assets that are gonna go up top as opposed to the long-term assets. The liquid assets might be an indication for individuals that would be easier to, to note in that it means those assets that you're gonna be able to use fairly soon in order to, to pay off your bills. You wanna be comparing your liquid assets to your current liabilities, those bills, those things that are coming due within the next year. Because you can't, of course, pay off something like your credit card bill or something like that by selling the couch or the home, not very easily at least. So this might include things, and note what we have here is a, an account category this isn't really accounts, right? Because the accounts would go into this account category and those would include things like cash, the savings accounts. And then when you're talking about investments, like in stocks and bonds, you might have a separate category for, st for stocks and bonds, or you might try to break out a separate category based on whether those stocks and bonds are under an umbrella of something like an IRA or a 401k plan, in which case they're no longer something that you can easily access, meaning if they're under the umbrella of a retirement plan, to get them out, you would be penalized and therefore there's more restriction on them. If you just have money in an investment account that's not under the umbrella of an IRA or a 401k, it's not as liquid as cash, but you can sell those at least without being penalized. You might have a tax consequence for it, but then it might still be considered liquid. So you have, you have and note also that when we look at personal finances, we're not following, say, generally accepted accounting principles as we do with U.S. corporate tax or corporate accounting if we're looking at publicly traded companies. And therefore, it's less standardized and that actually makes it more difficult. So some of these choices, you got to think about, well, what do you think is the best choice for me? Rather than just saying, what's the law say, <laughs> which is kind of more concrete on the business side. So investment assets. So investment assets, we're gonna put up here in under the liquid assets, we're breaking them out into basically another category. You can think about them as a separate category, or you can think about them you know, in the as part of the liquid assets if they're not under the umbrella. The investment assets might be things, you might include this category as basically your retirement assets, things that are long-term, things that you don't plan on touching until retirement, so that you make sure that they're separate in your bookkeeping needs because they're not gonna be used to spend in the current uh, current portion. And then you have household assets, which would be an equivalent to, to the business side of like property, plant, and equipment uh, types of things, P, P, and E. And these are gonna be things that uh, are kind of tangible type of things that you can't really, you can't, again, sell too easily in order to pay off your current bills. So the biggest thing you might, you might consider is like, of course, your home, is something and the home's a little bit different if, if you've got a home 
because it is something that you're expecting hopefully to increase in value as opposed to every other thing that you generally have like a tv or a car or a couch they might you know you might have a whole lot of stuff with that's very valuable if you were to auction auction it off but you're not planning on auctioning it off and therefore those types of things are not really where your focus generally is depending on what you're making the financial statements for and when you do put them on the books you have to appraise them because i don't know how much my couch was worth that i you know purchased five years ago or my coffee table or something like that they might be quite expensive but and and you and it just depends on what you're listing this stuff out for right if you if you had a, a problem and someone stole your couch and you got to report it to insurance or something like that of course you want the couch there if you want to give this to somebody else so that they can value it and possibly get a loan or something like that if they want to know what you can put on as collateral or something that could be helpful if you're using your financial statements for your current usage to see how well you, you're planning for retirement and how well you're paying down your your debt and, and planning that kind of thing it's probably not the most important thing to have things like your tv on there and whatnot because it may not be add, adding the value for that purpose that you'd be looking for and it does have complications with it too because you have to think about uh, devaluing it which would generally be an adjusting entry meaning if i put my car on here for example next year my car's worth less and i would have to write down the value which is an adjusting entry that's going into an accrual type of thing that we'd have to start to think about accrual kind of concepts because if we were on a pure a cash basis we wouldn't even put the car on there we would have just written off the cash when we basically bought the car right if we paid cash for it so if i paid cash for the car then on a pure cash basis i would just write it off and have this huge expense for that period so that's why we deviate from a cash basis to an accrual basis. But if I go to an accrual basis and I put the car on there, then I should be depreciating it or writing it down in value. So just note those kind of issues with that category. But that category would include cars, possibly a home. You know, if you want to include your household goods, right, you might try to estimate what your household goods are. It depends how detailed you want to get what purpose you're using it for as to how many different kinds of household goods you're going to put there. So then we're going to have total assets, and we'll put this in the outer column. So I'm going to just simply add these up. We'll just do it in the trusty calculator, 5,000 plus the 9,200 plus 9,700. There's our 111,200 for the total assets. Notice I've got this indented. So we have the assets colon, meaning it's going to be a subcategory indented, brought into the inside. And then we have this indentation to bring it back to the outside. Also note when I sum things up, we're not typically going to be jumping from column to column. We're just going to be adding one column at a time. In this case, we added just the column to the left. Sometimes we will add just the column up above. And that knowing that once reports get kind of long can be a little bit easier and less intimidating to look at the reports and e easier to construct as well. Then we're going to have our liabilities. We've got the current liabilities. This is going to be the same term that we use on the business side. On the business side, usually current liabilities is like accounts payable is the main occurrence liabilities on the on the personal side your current liabilities are things that you're going to owe in the short term that would include most likely credit card payments that you'd have that you're going to expect to be paying usually the convention is within one year so the convention is within one year now note that if you compare that to the long-term liabilities there's going to be another problem from the accounting side of things that you got to think about and, and how you treat it will be different as to the two methods of accounting you might be doing. Are you actually recording this in QuickBooks, transaction by transaction, or putting this together periodically to help you basically make decisions on a periodic basis from the resources that you have? And that is that if you have something like a mortgage or a, a loan on your car or something like that, then it might be over a year loan, meaning I don't want to group that up in current liabilities because there's a long-term piece to it However, there's still a current portion to it because I, I'm paying the next 12 months. I, I should include the next 12 months as current. And so if you're doing bookkeeping kind of transactions, that would be another kind of adjusting entry that you'd normally do kind of periodically adjusting and fixing the difference between the current portion of the long-term loans that you have into the current portion. The reason you want to see the current portion here is because you would like to compare that to your liquid assets meaning do i have enough liquid assets to pay off my liabilities that are current 
that are going to be due within the next year. If you have more current liabilities than you have liquid assets, then you may have a liquidity problem. You may have a cash flow problem that's going to be happening at some point in time. And what can you do about that? Then you can try to take action, either earn more money, get more cash, sell some stocks or something like that if you have to, or see if you can refinance some of the debt to make it more basically long term so that you can meet your short term you know, obligations in that case. And then if we add these up, we got the 86,000 plus the 2,500 gives us the 88,5, pulling that to the outside, same convention. We got the liabilities colon, and we indented them here, pulled them into the inner column, and then the total we pulled out to the outer column of the 88,5. And then we have the difference between the assets and the liabilities. Notice we're only adding and subtracting in one column, now working in the outer column of the 111200 minus hold on, there's one too many ones, 200 minus the 88500, that's going to give us our 227 hour net worth. So notice how we're putting this together. If we were constructing this basically, and if you're using software that's basically pulling information in from, from your financial institutions, which you can do, and it, won't, it will not pick up your household goods, you'll have to estimate your household because that's not from a financial institution, but things like your investments and your, and your, um, and your bank accounts, it can pull those things in. And then you can, it can even pull in some of the liabilities, your credit card liabilities and whatnot. And it can basically construct this. And then it's just going to take the difference between those two. And that'll give you your 22 seven. However, if you do this in something like QuickBooks or X zero, or you actually do the bookkeeping note that uh, this 22 seven is something that you can reconcile to the income statement. Because what this balance sheet is, is really only telling you where you stand at a certain point in time. You should be able to compare this, this bottom line number, which kind of represents where we are financially at this point. We're worth 22.7 or whatever financially. If I compare that to the prior period, I should be able, I should be able to say, well, what's the difference? I mean, if, I mean, if last period I was at 22,000 and this period I have a net worth of 22.7, the next question is, well, how did I get from 20,000 or 22,000 to 227, right? How did I get from that point to this point? That's the story, that's the income statement, that's the statement where this kind of method, just kind of piecing this together or pulling in the end results from software doesn't do so well. That's where something like the actual accounting, the QuickBooks software gives you a much better indication of your performance usually. But, but even no matter what method you're using, the next thing is to piece together the income statement to say, well, how did I get from there to here, that's your performance statement. That's what you actually action statement. That's the action statement that you can then use as a baseline usually for budgeting into the future.